Well, I think we'll just begin on time and uh, I'm sure some other people will be joining us uh, over the next few minutes. Just to introduce myself quickly, my name is Jane Clark, I'm Museum and Heritage Manager with Mid and East Antrim Borough Council. And we're here this evening to hear an online lecture by Dr. Matthew Jebb, who's going to be speaking on the subject of Matilda Knowles, uh, a trailblazing lichenologist. And this presentation is part of a funded project which the Museum Service in Midney Centrum is currently running with funding from Northern Museums Council and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And our project is called Cultivating Change and it's looking at raising awareness around climate change. So thank you for joining us. And the format for this evening, I'll just explain for you. Firstly, uh, Dr. Matthew Jebb will be speaking for about half an hour. Then we don't have a chat function, but after the presentation is over, there is a function at the bottom of your screen for Q&A. So if you would like to ask any questions, please do so. And I will compare them with Matthew and he will make his responses. And hopefully your question will be answered um, quickly and efficiently so that you get the response you're looking for. And um, then the evening will conclude. And we think it'll finish probably around between eight 15, 8.30 this evening. So once again, thank you for joining us. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce you, Matthew Jebb, who's very kindly agreed to give the presentation this evening. Matthew is director at the National Botanical Gardens, Glasnevin, in Dublin. And he um, has a lot of expertise on the subject matter and uh, this is gonna be a fascinating talk. So please just sit back and enjoy. Thank you, Matthew. Great, Jane, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank Jane Clark for you know reaching out to us in the first place to inquire about Matilda Knowles and um, out of those conversations grew the idea to give a talk not only about Matilda Knowles but also about the study of lichens and just how extraordinary she, extraordinary she was in the way she took the subjects of lichens forward here in Ireland. Um, she made a, a remarkable contribution to that. It starts up in the north in Ballymena, um, and Matilda Knowles was one of uh, three daughters born to the Knowles family, um, who lived at Arthur Cottage in Cullibaki, just outside Ballymena. And William James Knowles, her father, was one of these extraordinary amateur scientist. Whilst he was a, a land agent and he worked for the, uh, amongst others, the Casement family, um, William Knowles had a passion for archaeology. And perhaps the, the most important aspect of his um, life is exemplified with White Park Bay here. I'm sorry, I just moved my name out of the way. White Park Bay, uh, up in North Antrim on the coast there. William Knowles discovered that these dunes were extraordinarily rich in flint fragments from the Neolithic era. What he um, was able to discover was not only were these flints deposited in the dunes in enormous numbers. He gathered in total over 4,000 flint instruments, but he also uncovered the remains of settlements. And one of the reasons that uh, William Knowles is often referred to as the father of Ulster antiquaries is that he excavated more carefully uh, and documented his finds far more methodically than many others at the time. At the time, people would have excavated Neolithic items and literally sieved them out of the soil. Their, their goal, if you like, was to collect these items, but not appreciate the context in which they were found. And one of the things that William Knowles did was that he took a great interest in this. Two of his daughters, Matilda, who we are talking about uh, this evening, and also um, her younger sister, Margaret, they were both very skilled draftswomen, and they prepared all of the plates for his publications. And this is uh, one of the publications from the work he did in White Park Bay uh, of a hut circle. 
So very detailed drawing of the placement of the stones. He undertook all of this work in around the 18, early 1870s. And when he gave a, a public talk about it in 1874 in Dublin, Unfortunately, huge numbers of these amateur archaeologists descended upon White Park Bay and essentially disturbed the entire site. And it's, it was one of the problems, I suppose, of that era that people, uh, in a sense, were ignorant of the importance of understanding the context. And it was on this beach in 18. 97, so some 30 years after he'd made his uh, original discoveries, um, that the, the Knowles family met up with a party of uh, eight senior archaeologists from various institutions, in particular, the uh, director of the then fledgling Museum of Science and Art in Dublin, what was to become our uh, national museum here. Um, they met up and William Knowles explained and demonstrated essentially the whole history of the site. And this was a, a very significant meeting because at this point in time, Matilda Knowles had already been attending um, the Royal College of Science down in Dublin, where she had been uh, receiving instruction in botany from the Professor Johnson there, who I will come to later. And the fact that she spent several days here with Colonel Plunkett, the director of the museum, was undoubtedly a wonderful piece of serendipity, because within uh, three years of that meeting, she was employed as an assistant in the museum in Dublin, and essentially achieved a position in her career that at the time was very unusual for a woman. And as I, as I talk this evening, you will understand some of the problems that um, you know, gender raised when you were attempting to have a professional career or interest. And it is to his great credit that William Knowles clearly fostered uh, an interest in education and science in his daughters. And he was able to essentially ensure that they had a very fulfilled and active professional lives through the fact that he encouraged their education at every opportunity. Just to give you an idea of um, the location of these things, they're up in close to uh, Ballintoy is um, the, the beach that I've just been talking about, White Park Bay Beach, where he made these extraordinary discoveries. But perhaps the most celebrated discoveries he made uh, was at a mountain there, which is marked with a little red pointer. Um, and this is uh, a, a mountain which consists of a volcanic plug in the glens of Antrim there. And it's uh, Tjov Buliach, which is a 400 meter uh, mountain of extraordinary um, historical importance, because it is at this site um, that uh, William Knowles excavated a huge number of porcelainite axe heads. And a little drawing that his daughters prepare, prepared for his publication shows where these outcrops occur up on the upper slopes of this great extinct volcano. Uh, porcelainite, uh, as its name suggests, is a very fine grained volcanic stone much like porcelain, it's very, very hard. And during the Neolithic era, huge numbers of axe heads were manufactured here. They were chipped out of the, the ground in an era, uh, probably a, uh, an era about 5,000 years ago, um, and ground down into these wonderful axe heads. Um, William Knowles essentially made this discovery through talking to, to um, local informants who would have told him about uh, Flint's workstone. He was hunting these down. And it was not until after his death that uh, we discovered that these axe heads are not only distributed all over Ireland, but they even spread uh, across Britain. Um, and they uh, represent a very important export 
crop at the time. It was a, a major site of axe manufacture and exportation. And he was the first archaeologist to really examine uh, an axe factory and work out uh, where the manufacture and construction of these stones was uh, taking place. On his death, um, it is extraordinary that um, his collection of stone artifacts, really essentially from Antrim and a few other sites around Dublin, uh, sorry, around uh, Ireland from the east and west coast, uh, something like 32,000 uh, items were uh, auctioned by Sotheby's. The whole sale took four days, and it represented an extraordinary uh, trove of our knowledge of the Neolithic in Ireland. Um, sadly, a lot of those were bought by museums uh, in Britain, and it wasn't until the 1960s that a substantial donation of them came back to the Ulster Museum. So now at least they are in their, uh, the island of their discovery. One of the most significant naturalists of our uh, entire history here in Ireland would be Robert Lloyd Prager, uh, an Ulsterman born in uh, and bred in uh, Belfast. Robert Lloyd Prager had an extraordinary inquiring mind. He was a uh, an engineer by training, a librarian by profession, but a, a naturalist, and in particular, a botanist uh, by um, his uh, passion. And one of the most important botanical books ever printed in Ireland was produced in 1901, their Irish Topographical Botany, which is essentially a census of all the plants of Ireland. But the important point of Robert Lloyd Prager is his birth date there, 1865. He was born just one year uh, after Matilda Knowles. And William Knowles, her father, would have regularly brought Matilda and her sister Margaret to meetings of the Belfast Naturalist Field Club, where they would have met and probably known uh, Robert Lloyd Prager very well. And it is in the ITB that we have some fantastic evidence of the that um, meeting of minds, if you like, this respect that Prager uh, had for uh, Matilda Knowles's knowledge of botany. He walked probably in excess of uh, 6,000 miles across the uh, landscape of Ireland recording plants over a period of just uh, five years. Um, he couldn't do it all by himself. And these maps on the far left, we see maps of the knowledge before he began, began this work. On the right-hand side, we see uh, Robert Lloyd Prager's contribution to the work. And in the middle map, we see the contribution of other botanists, colleagues of his who helped him with this enormous project of recording plants uh, throughout the landscape. And in the uh, acknowledgements at the beginning of Irish topographical botany, we see that three counties, Miss Knowles, so that would have been Matilda Knowles, supplied information on County Clare, County Tyrone, and County Antrim. So she was the source of uh, plant records for these counties, and it spared him from uh, conducting further field work there. This led to him being able in later life to publish one of his most uh, famous books, The Way That I Went, which essentially documents those travels that on foot he learnt so much of the sort of law and history uh, of Ireland as he went about. So published um, much later in his life, this records in many ways uh, both later travels, but in particular, these five years he spent uh, marching across the Midlands of Ireland. Now, as I said earlier, Matilda and Margaret, her sister Margaret, they both moved down to Dublin uh, probably around 1896. So the year before they were to meet Colonel Plunkett on the, the beach up in um, uh, sorry, in White Park Bay up in Antrim. And that was a significant moment because at that time, when she was down in Dublin, she was uh, learning 
very advanced botany from Professor Thomas Johnson. And you will note again, 1864, he is born in the same year um, as Matilda Knowles. So they are exact contemporaries in age. But Professor Johnson would have learned his um, botany uh, over in London. And he came to Dublin uh, at the behest of Sir Robert Kane. Robert Kane became the first president of University College Cork, and he was an extraordinary man when it came to education. In his view, the most important thing for, for Ireland, especially in Dublin there, was that the artisans and middle classes should be able to get hold of an education at any time in their life. And he established what he referred to as the Museum of Irish Industry here at uh, 51 St. Stephen's Green, this remarkable building that the Office of Public Works at one point uh, occupied. It's now the Department of Justice. But the Museum of Irish Industry had entire halls filled with the products of Ireland, whether it was uh, linen, uh, basket work, turf, or the stones of Ireland. The front hall of that building has an incredible collection of marbles, limestones, and so on from different uh, strata across the island of Ireland. So the Museum of Irish Industry was a place that you could attend uh, lectures, and they were in all the natural sciences, physics, geology, chemistry, zoology, and botany. And it was the forerunner of what later became uh, the Royal College uh, of Science uh, before it moved over to um, Merrion Street. It is now occupied by the Department of the Taoiseach, so it's become a government building. But at the time, it was an extraordinary uh, public um, good that Robert Kane had uh, worked to develop a place where people could get a wonderful education. And so Matilda Knowles and her, her sister Margaret attended lectures here under Professor Thomas Johnson, who recognized uh, um, her talent, her natural talent for botany. And within a few years, after her uh, receiving instructions in botany, she was working in what was the uh, new uh, National Museum, the Museum of Art and Science in Kildare Street, just a few blocks away from uh, St. Stephen's Green. And once she was there, she assisted Professor Johnson in the production of uh, publications. She did a lot of the illustrating, but she also managed the development and growth of this remarkable botany collection in the museum of economic botany. Professor Johnson and herself wrote to and solicited material from uh, organizations and individuals all over, not only the Europe, but the world. And you'll see that Thomas Johnson always pays uh, due regard to Matilda Knowles's skills. So though I am responsible for this list um, uh, and its form, it takes the preparation is due to my assistant, uh, Miss Matilda Cullen Knowles. Amongst the extraordinary collections in the museum is this huge baobab fruit from the Congo Basin. And you'll see the label there, uh, explains that it is Roger Casement himself who brought that specimen in. Roger Casement uh, was, uh, besides that being a, later in, in life, an Irish uh, patriot who was uh, shot in, in London for treason, uh, having come ashore with uh, arms from a, a U-boat in County Cork uh, during 1916, just prior to the rising. Um, Roger Casement was uh, a world traveler and he joined the British civil service whilst in the Congo. And from the Congo, he produced an extraordinary report on what King Leopold was up to in the, essentially the heart of darkness. Uh, so um, Roger Casement's report on the brutal conditions uh, running in the Congo where people were obliged to produce rubber, ivory, uh, coffee, uh, chocolate, all for the enrichment of the uh, King of Belgium, King Leopold, was a, a turning point in 
the way people viewed colonialism uh, in Europe, in particular, the, the colonization and exploitation of Africa. And besides that baobab fruit, we have these extraordinary cocoa beans uh, from the upper Congo. When Roger Casement was collecting those beans, he would have witnessed um, appalling human rights abuses all around him. And that essentially was why he was there. He was there to prepare a report, which he delivered to the British government in Westminster. And it led essentially to the Belgians removing King Leopold uh, from his position as running this private uh, enrichment program in the Congo. Uh, and uh, it, essentially the colony uh, was quickly demolished as uh, a site of human right abuses, all down to the work of Roger Casement. But the important thing to, to realize is that Roger Casement was uh, brought up close to Balamina as well. Um, and he is an exact contemporary born in the same year as Matilda Knowles. So in his early teens, it is almost certain that uh, William Knowles, her father, who acted as the um, land agent to the family, would have introduced his daughter to Roger Casement. And it does explain why in 1904, having come from this extraordinary mission in Africa, that Roger Casement then coming back to Dublin, came to visit Matilda Knowles in the museum and handed over these extraordinary specimens that he had gathered. And they provide a remarkable, tangible link to this period of history. Now, Robert Lloyd Prager had moved to Dublin from Belfast just in the early uh, 1890s when he began his work on this uh, topographic um, survey of the plants of Ireland. And he was the leading botanist of his day. And it was little surprise that when Cecil Baring, um, a wealthy banker from uh, England, bought Lambay Island off Dublin, he invited Robert Lloyd Prager to gather together uh, naturalist friends, bring them out to Lambay and survey the island for the biology and life on it. And this was a remarkable turning point in sort of botanical knowledge in Ireland, because it was the first time that uh, a number of naturalists had gathered in one spot. So in total, uh, Prager invited about 12 naturalists out, and they spent three short seasons over 1905 and 1906, ransacking the island for species. And they uncovered 90 species new to Ireland and five species new to science. And amongst the collaborators in that work was Matilda Knowles herself, that in June 1906, we can see she was on the island because she collected this rather rare geranium, geranium pusillum, uh, a, a, a small geranium that still grows on the island to this day, but it's, it's scarce. It's only found in a dozen or so sites in Ireland. One of the extraordinary things about that specimen is Matilda Knowles never gathered a single lichen from the island of Lambay. And whilst the publication on all of that work on the island um, details a great deal of information about lichens and flowering plants, it is clear that when she went, she only looked at flowering plants. But the point of that Lambay survey was so extraordinary, the results were so extraordinary, that Prager decided to take an island on the west coast of Ireland and do a far more detailed study. So uh, he brought something like 100 different scientists to the island of, of Clare, Clare Island in Clue Bay, and their mission was to research their speciality on the island and try and find out if there was anything unique about the island different from the mainland. An important point of that survey is there is uh, Mr. Prager himself in the background. Uh, there were 100 scientists involved and only two women. Um, it was a sign of the times that uh, being a professional scientist was not something that uh, women were ever encouraged to do, and certainly uh, not an easy thing for them to break into. But we have in our collection again from 1909, this was the year that the 
whole project was initiated on Clare Island, uh, a large number of lichen specimens collected by Matilda Knowles, and you can see that is one of six on that sheet, um, and she's collected uh, a specimen, a specimen of a, a lichen known as the um, orange lichen. This is a, a, a truly um, glowing orange-colored um, lichen. Covers uh, the rocks of, of um, throughout Ireland, all along the coastlines. Sometimes known as the maritime sunburst lichen because of its wonderful. Um, orangey yellow colors. So in 1909, she is collecting numerous specimens of one of the most common and widespread species. She's collecting them because they all look a bit different. And it's only later on that she realizes they're not different. And essentially she says to um, Robert Prager, um, I can't work on these lichens. I just cannot understand really their variation and what species are what. Um, they are diverse and complicated organisms. Uh, one of the interesting things about Ireland is we probably have uh, well over a thousand species, 1200 species here, far more than the number of native flowering plant species. Uh, what's interesting about that is that here on the island of Ireland, we would have less than half a percent of the flowering plant species of the world, but we have at least 7% of the lichens of the world. So Ireland is exceptionally rich in lichens. Um, what are lichens? Well, here's a typical sort of rock on the west coast of Ireland. It's actually on uh, Shirkin Island. And you can see all these different colors and shapes and structures. I think all of us are familiar with seeing lichens, whether in, in graveyards, on the branches of trees. And we probably stop and wonder. Um, but very few of us are able to uh, point at a particular species and give it a name. They are complicated things. And one of the amazing things about them is how they essentially clothe the surface of soils, rocks, twigs and branches. Almost any uh, substrate on this planet is covered in lichens. Um, but the vast majority of us will pass them by because they are complex and difficult things to identify. They're small. They're beyond our easy vision. We need a lens to really appreciate their complexity. And seen under an electron microscope, you can see this is a much enlarged section through a, a lichen. We see this extraordinary combination. They are a symbiotic organism. The word symbiosis was actually coined to describe what a lichen is. Um, and it was only in the 1870s uh, that this term symbiosis was first raised as a, a description of what a lichen is. So we can see what essentially looks like um, spaghetti there. That is tiny hyphal um, tubes of a fungus. And this fungus is what makes the body of the lichen. But you can see those little green spheres in the upper surface. These are algae. They are algal cells. They're algae, which you will find sometimes just growing on the surface of bark. They, they're free living algae, but they are coming to live inside this lichen. And it gives the two organisms, the fungus and the algae, the opportunity to live together in a mutually um, beneficial relationship. Symbiosis literally means living together. So um, Albert uh, Frank, who used this term for the first time, this German botanist, he was the first one to really recognize the universality of how lichens formed. But it's something that we are still discovering uh, a lot about. And it's, it's only literally six years ago that these two lichens in North America uh, were studied using DNA. The reason that DNA uh, project was undertaken is the one on the left there, the bright green one, is toxic. It, it will um, poison you. It, it's deadly. In fact, it's uh, the acid in there, vulpinic acid, comes from the wolf because traditionally 
uh, bright green lichens in Europe were actually used to be wrapped in meat. They could poison a wolf. So it was a great way of pest control if you were a, a shepherd, for example. But the, uh, the lichen on the right-hand side there, Briaria fremontii, was gathered by uh, Native Americans for millennia as a food substance. It's perfectly edible. When you looked at these two lichens with um, at their DNA, they were identical. Not only was the fungus identical, but so was the algae living inside them symbiotically. And the reason the one on the left is toxic is because it has got a yeast in there. It is a, um, a literally a third partner in the symbiosis. And it has now been found that this third partner in the symbiosis is quite widespread. It's not a, a universal thing, but it just goes to show how even uh, up until six years ago, we're still finding things out about lichens, this, these extraordinary symbiotic organisms. After Matilda Knowles said to Robert Lloyd Prager, you know, I really can't do these on my own, he said, right, well, let us get the expert in the British Museum over in London, Annie Lorraine Smith. Uh, only 10 years Matilda Knowles senior, but uh, Annie Smith had an, an extraordinarily similar upbringing, a remarkable parallel. Um, her father um, encouraged her to, to move to London because she was brought up in Scotland. Uh, he encouraged her to move to London and to take up the study of botany, which she did. And she went to the Royal College of Science in South Kensington. So exactly the same name as of uh, the organization that Matilda Knowles attended in Dublin, uh, where she was uh, not only taught and trained by Duncan Field Scott, uh, a botanist, but he also took her to work at the British Museum. Now, incredibly, whilst people know that she worked at the British Museum, she was never employed by them. She had to be funded from a special fund outside the museum because she could not be officially employed at the museum as a professional woman. Again, an extraordinary indication of that era where women were literally excluded from uh, professions uh, such as botany, natural sciences. And here we see a specimen collected in Castle Bar, so on the, the mainland opposite Clare Island in County Mayo, and this um, is collected by Matilda Knowles and Annie Lorraine Smith. So whilst Annie Lorraine Smith only spent a few weeks on Clare Island uh, with Matilda Knowles, Matilda Knowles visited her in London after that the following year. She was given time off from the museum. And from a standing start that Matilda Knowles knew nothing about uh, lichens in 1909. Here is a specimen collected by Matilda Knowles on Hoth Head in, in Dublin in 1912, and she is naming it as a new species, Verucaria Lorraine Smithii, after Annie Lorraine Smith. So she moved from not knowing lichens in 1909 to being essentially in 1912 a fully fledged taxonomist describing new species of lichens. And this new zeal for lichens uh, obviously coloured quite literally her work at the museum because here she prepared a wonderful display of lichens. Then you can see the little lichen, uh, dried out lichens on the inner side of this circle of sheep's wool dyed by the particular species of lichens. All of these different lichen species producing quite remarkably strikingly colored and differently colored dyes. And this would have been an item put up in the um, National Museum as a way to educate the public on the interest and significance of lichens. And here just a year later, 1913, and this is in the paper that she published, uh, Verucaria Lorraine Smithii, after her teacher, so to speak. Matilda Knowles publishes a, a major work on the lichens of Hoth Head. And wherever you are in Ireland, wherever you go down to the beach, you will see this incredible zonation, this bright uh, orange band that you can see above the uh, 
mean high water of even of spring tides this orange band of the um uh, amazing belt it was referred to as the orange belt of the maritime sunburst lichen amongst other species and just below that orange band you'll see that thick black line of verrucarias uh, verrucaria mora which is uh, latin for, for for dark or black um, this zonation pattern is something that is repeated uh, all across uh, the all around the coastlines not only of ireland but of of northern europe even below uh, high water of springs, this little uh, brown seaweed here, Pelvitia, you can see around the base of it is a lichen, uh, Lichenia pygmaea, which actually grows uh, just below the highest water, uh, the highest tides. And what uh, Matilda Knowles was doing here is she discovered that rather than just three bands, she could discern five particular bands. So here we have the, the so-called tar spot lichen, one of these verrucarias, forming what appears to be a black splodge on the, the rocks, but is actually a lichen, a symbiosis of algae living inside a, a fungal thallus. Above that, we get uh, gradually those tar spots die out and we start to get a mixture of white, grey and orange lichens. And then we get into the orange belt with these, the, the sunburst lichen. And then finally, we get up to something referred to as sea ivory, uh, ramelina, this uh, almost uh, shrubby uh, lichen, several uh, inches long in cases. Um, it goes brittle and hard when it's dry, but when wet, it is uh, supple. And again, all of these lichens are, were traditionally used for uh, dyeing wool, dyeing clothing. And within another 12 years, Matilda Knowles has advanced to the point of producing an extraordinary um, parallel to the Irish topographical botany for lichens, all of the lichens of Ireland. And this is um, a tome of, of a book. It is uh, many hundreds of pages, 250 pages in length, 800 species of lichen described in detail, 100 of them new to science, including many, uh, sorry, 100 new to Ireland, and including many new to science that Matilda Knowles herself described. Uh, we have in our collections here an interleaved copy of it with all of her notes, literally preparing herself for a, a second edition of it. And it is worth noting that after her death uh, in 1933, Robert Lloyd Prager pointed out that this is probably the one of the finest pieces of work ever carried out in any section of the Irish flora. Now, Robert Lloyd Prager was notoriously grumpy in his later years, and to have given such an extraordinarily positive glow just demonstrates the esteem in which he held Matilda Knowles. Um, and I'm delighted to say that in 2014, um, the organization uh, Women in Technology and Science organized that a blue plaque would be set up on the National Herbarium here in the Botanic Gardens because the home in which Matilda Knowles lived with her sister Margaret um, in Dublin has long since disappeared. And therefore, there was nowhere else to put the plaque other than on the building in which her life's work is so beautifully preserved. Thank you very much. I will now end that and I hope we can go to Okay. End. Thank, thank you very, very much, Matthew. That was a really all. interesting talk. And um, just before we move on from it to open to questions, um, I'd just like to comment on some of the things that you were discussing in your talk, which might help stimulate some questions now yes. at the end. Yeah. So what I found particularly interesting is the way that you first of all contextualise Matilda Knowles in terms of her life and times and the influences that would have been on her as she was growing up and in her cultural life as well as her academic pursuits. So that gives us a sense of what was motivating her to get an interest in botany and obviously the curious curiosity within the family um, and recording work that she was doing for her father would have been very helpful to her. 
it's interesting you talk about how women in terms of their professional careers it was difficult for them to be established and they obviously needed to rely on men to get to introduce them to certain circles so that they could have a career within science and that maybe is something that some of our audience want to pick up on I thought visually your presentation was very appealing um, you you show in fact that a, a, quite a, a overlooked variety of um, uh, of fungi plant life has has actually got a, a beauty of its own in terms of its visual effects. So I, th I know we have at least one artist in the audience who will be interested in her views on that. Uh, and finally, um, it's interesting that uh, County Antrim seems to have contributed so much to archaeology, as we know, but also to natural sciences, which is something that we weren't aware of before we uh, undertook this project because we knew so little about Matilda Knowles. And we're very grateful for you taking part this evening because you've certainly given us so much more information about her place in society and her contribution to science. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to our participants this evening. If you'd like to ask any questions, please use the Q&A function and I will um, ask your question for you to Matthew. I'd like to also just say from a housekeeping point of view that at the very end of the presentation this evening, there will be a survey or poll will pop up on your screen and there's five questions there. And we'd really appreciate if you just take a few moments to answer them. It helps us to understand our audiences better and um, will help us to develop our programming in future. So thank you for doing that. Not at all. So our, we've got a question. And this is from Jenny Matthew, and she asks, is there any record of Matilda's findings in County Clare? Uh, they will be in our historiographical botany. It is listed because Matilda Knowles uh, would have kept detailed uh, lists of all the, the plants she would have found in places like County Clare. It is not compiled in one spot, but it is something that... Um, you know, is is disparate. And one of the interesting stories that I um, have told here, I suppose, is the fact that I have approached this purely from a botanical point of view. That you know, that that I have not had uh, access to diaries or information because it doesn't exist. So we know very little about Matilda Knowles. And what we have gathered is the anecdotal uh, storyline of who she was, where she came from, who she would have met, um, and we're able to piece it together. And we can see just simply uh, the, the brief obituary that um, Robert Lloyd Prager writes, uh, his clear um, collaboration with her in preparing Irish topographical botany, um, and the fact that she, as a woman, was able to move into essentially a male-dominated world in the museum there um, and achieve the position she, she did reach is based purely on her expertise and her abilities. Um, the thing that has always struck me so much is this fact that I can find specimens in the herbarium that she's made on Lambay. Traditionally, she's known as a, as a lichenologist, but she didn't pick up a single lichen when she was there. And we also see that in 1909, her collections, not that they're poor, they're, they're expertly prepared, but she's collecting the same thing repeatedly, not appreciating a, a differ differentiation from one species to the other. And you know the, the speed at which she gathered this knowledge from Annie Lorraine Smith um, just in that brief season in 1910 is breathtaking. It's breathtaking because two years later she is a taxonomist describing new species of lichens. And it's worth pointing out that Annie Lorraine Smith wrote the Lichens of Britain in and published that in 1921. Um, and essentially, you know, her her best student, Matilda Knowles, does just the same for Ireland. So it, it is a wonderful insight, really, into how these two women were both trailblazers in an area that um, 
strangely, had been overlooked. And it's not to say that men did not study lichens, because they did all across Europe. Um, there was a great tradition of the uh, lichenology, algology, small, tiny plants being studied by uh, botanists right across Europe. But for some reason in Britain and Ireland, um, it, it was these two ladies who really were the torch bearer, bearers of the subject. Okay, thank you, um, Matthew. And now we turn to Paul's question. And Paul, you'll have to forgive me if I don't pronounce this properly. Uh, Matthew, Paul's asking, is there a record of where Matilda found the rare, now I'm going to spell this out, um, yep. A-C-A-R-O-S-P-O-R-A, B-E-N-E-D-A-R-N-E-N-S-I-S, on Howarth Head? Almost certainly there is. Uh, in a notebook, which um, she must have had at the time. And I would say the best place to look for that is that when Paul is next up in um, the herbarium, and he is a regular visitor here, as he is the, the current torchbearer of the study of lichens in Ireland, um, I would say, Paul, we will find that in the interleaved copy of the lichens of Ireland. I would I wouldn't be surprised if she has got a note in there. You'll have noticed on my slide just how many notes she does have, um, and it is uh, perhaps an opportunity to to look up and see. Well, can we uh, track down that location? One of the great pleasures, actually, of uh, looking at specimens collected by Robert Lloyd Prager, Matilda Knowles, is that now and again they have written details of where they have found something. And you can go back to that same spot a hundred years later, and lo and behold, the plant is still there. It's often a, you know, an extremely cheering sight how um, rugged nature is, that it can survive um, the appalling uh, mess we often throw at it as humans. So I'd be optimistic, Paul. <laughs> okay, now moving on actually to a colleague of mine, uh, Alison Diver, who's working on our project, uh, Cultivating Change. Alison asks, uh, might be outside your scope, Matthew, but are you aware of any lichen recorders still active in Ireland? Well, obviously, we've just had the question. We've had Paul Wheeler there, yes. Well, uh, do you know, is interesting, are there any art collectives working with lichens? Yes, a number of artists have taken up the um, the paintbrush, so to speak, when they have, I think one of the slides I showed there, you know, a branch with a, a forest of different coloured lichens. There are some spectacularly uh, coloured and um, beauteous lichens around. Um, but often these are very rare and unusual. Um, and all of us should be mindful when we collect lichens that if we do spot something that looks truly spectacular and different, um, to be cautious, to be cautious not to um, grab it off the tree and take it home. Sometimes lichens take hundreds of years to grow. Uh, some of them are very slow growing species. Um, others are fast. But we should always be aware that um, in gathering lichens, the best thing to gather is fallen twigs and branches. Um, you can return a, a rock or a stone to a beach. So by all means, take these home, uh, paint them, study them, and you can either return that rock to the beach or that twig, the branch that's fallen off a tree. Those lichens are, are doomed to die anyway. So um, you can either... Uh, keep them, dry them out, or even place that twig or branch in another a living bush. And you'll be amazed how the lichen can actually survive there for uh, a long period of time if it's in the same airy condition as an epiphyte. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Paul has just come back, Alison, to say that Yanni Peters paints lichens. Yes. I'd like somebody yes. to follow up with. Yanni has a, a skill of, I think she must have a number of brushes with one or two bristles on them. Uh, Yanni is able to paint the smallest of mosses such that when you look at her painting, you think that is a real moss I'm looking at, is it? <laughs> or is it a painting? Um, 
you know, some of the detail that a botanical artist can capture is very, very striking. And, and Yanni Petters has got a particular knack of painting on glass as well. Um, and any of you who are fortunate enough to um, either be visiting the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, you will see there's a big gallery of uh, amazing botanical art. And Yanni Petters, I think, is the very first painting of a, it's a little moss plant, painted on the back of a sheet of glass, and it is something to behold. And Gisa has asked, uh, do you know of any lichen or plant species that have been named after Matilda? Has her work been well received by other contemporary lichenologists? In a, in a very beautiful sort of um, quirk of history, there is a Verrucaria nolzii, um, named by... Uh, a botanist over in Galway, McCarthy, Pat McCarthy. Um, and it, it, it's again nice because it's the same genus, Verrucaria Lorraine Smithii and Verrucaria Nolzii. They share the same genus and they were essentially such a remarkable pair of ladies. Um, it is very fitting that they each have a plant named after them. Um, Annie Lorraine Smith. That, that is the, the first lichen that was named after her and the only lichen that was named after her. So, you know, Matilda Knowles was very prescient in seeing, seeing it as a way to thank her, her teacher. Um, and the question about, you know, is her work uh, recognized today? Absolutely. It is the foundation on which uh, all later lichenologists can understand the lichens of Ireland. And it, it's fitting here because, uh, as Jane Clark described at the beginning there, this uh, series of talks is to consider climate change. And one of the interesting discoveries about lichens is that they are very, very, very slow to adapt to changing temperatures. We know from the study of DNA, we can, we can put together evolutionary trees of lichens and they do not move out of their different latitudes quickly. That's not to say that the lichens are gonna die on their feet. In fact, they're moving very rapidly across our landscape. So lichens are being uh, discovered further north than they were ever known 40 or 50 years ago, uh, simply through the fact that they are being dispersed. Lichens are very efficient at sporing out new baby lichens, so to speak. They, they release little microscopic granules of the fungus with the algae inside, and they blow on the wind, and they can travel many, many miles. Um, and it is apparent that lichens are on the march northwards. As our climate warms up, they are literally being pushed uh, northwards in the, certainly in the northern latitudes. So um, they are wonderful indicators, not only of climate, which we know fairly little about as yet, the study of lichens moving with climatic change, but historically they have been used as one of the finest indicators of uh, air pollution. So sulfur dioxide, for example, is extremely noxious to some species of lichens. And this is because the fungus is, is sensitive to them, whereas uh, other lichens prosper and are very happy when there's a lot of uh, nitrogen uh, around farms. When you get birds perching on a roof, you will see these bright orange lichens appearing uh, where the um, birds have roosted. So uh, they rely heavily on a big input of nitrogen. So while some lichens thrive, uh, others are killed off by sulfur. So in cities, uh, we often see trees completely bereft of lichens. We head to the west coast of Ireland and the lichens are literally dripping with um, a clothing of lichen all over their branches and twigs. Okay, that's lovely. And Paul has just made a little note to say that Matilda's seashore zonation is accepted worldwide. There you go. Yes. So, you know, that is still, uh, there is no advance on that. And whilst, of course, in science, we're always discovering something new, it is worth pointing out, you know, that her efficiency, her skill of identification, and her observations on Hoth are um, as good as, as we can make today. So, um, it's exceptionally reliable and we can use her uh, 1920s 
um, flora of the lichens of Ireland to really understand where they may have changed today, where, where new things have arrived or species have actually moved or whether they have survived. And these are the most important facts uh, that we need at our fingertips where, where we face a biodiversity crisis. We can all see and understand when a great orc disappears or um, a large animal becomes extinct. With flowering plants, it can be harder for the general population to appreciate the decline and rarity. And with lichens, it's even more overlooked. So, you know, that kind of baseline knowledge from 1929, 100 years ago, essentially, is of uh, enormous value and it grows every day. And, you know, that's an important thing about science is that historical work from 100 years ago gains in value with every year that passes. So, you know, as a, as a living memorial, her publication um, is not a fossilized book on a shelf. It is a state of our knowledge at the time. Thank you very much, Matthew. I'd just like to open the floor if there's any further questions before we close our session. And Jenny has come back to say, are there any lichenology courses in Ireland? Obviously inspired by this evening, Matthew. Well, again, Paul Whelan, who has been a, a, a good proposer of questions this evening. Uh, Paul Whelan, I know, has run courses uh, over in the west of Ireland. And, um, you know, the, the ability to pass on that knowledge, we can see from the story of of um, Annie Lorraine Smith and Matilda Knowles, it is so important. You cannot really learn lichens from a book. Yes, you can you can sit at home and go through a book and wonder, have I got it right? Um, but actually, the ability of seeing it hands on with an expert at your side. Um, Matilda Knowles essentially gave up in 1909. She said to um, Robert Lloyd Prague, you're, you, we're going to have to get assistance from somebody else. And what could have been more fortuitous and serendipitous than the arrival of Annie Lorraine Smith here in, in Ireland? And, and she would have been, you know, approaching uh, her early 60s. So, you know, traveling to a, a, an island off the west coast of Ireland in what would have been fairly uncomfortable conditions, little fishing boats and so on, uh, was a brave and striking move. And it, it, it again speaks of this great curiosity she must have had and the persuasive power of Robert Lloyd Prager to say, please come. And um, uh, it, it wouldn't have been in vain because he said, you know, I've got Matilda Knowles, who is a, a a really attentive and good botanist and your visit will pay dividends and indeed it did because Matilda Knowles went back and spent time at the British Museum really I suppose to cement her studies and her knowledge. So Matthew um, I think unless there's any more questions I'll just give a one final opportunity for anybody who'd like to ask Matthew anything before we finish this evening session. Okay, well, thank you very much, Matthew. That's been a really interesting talk. And from the range of questions, obviously people have been very interested and very inspired by what you've had to say. And perhaps Matilda Knowles will be uh, a better known uh, local botanist and scientist from the County Antrim after this presentation this evening. And just to note that the session has been recorded and it will be put out through Mid East Antrim Borough Council's YouTube channel probably within a week to 10 days this evening, if you'd like to see the presentation again or to share it with colleagues or friends. And just once again, Matthew, a vote of thanks. Thank you for taking your time to prepare the presentation and for providing us with interesting and valuable information and obviously a springboard for people who would like to find out more about Matilda and her work and about lichenology in general. And I think it is very well done the way you've linked it in with the project uh, aspiration to raise awareness around climate change. So thank you for that as well. Really appreciate it. So I'm just going to close this evening off now. Um, and thank you for our participants for taking time for joining us. And if you would like to find out any more about our project, you're more than welcome to contact me. My email address is jane, J-Y-N-E dot Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E at midandycentrum.co.uk. Many thanks and good evening.